rated five stars on Gulp. Hi, I'm Carly with Bookish Pixie Reads. Thank you for joining me today. I am going to be talking about all the books that I read for the month of October. And so I'm going to do my little analytics that I've been doing. So I read seven books by seven authors. Uh, five of the books were physical format and two were in audio format. All the books I read were female. I had a couple of uh, repeated authors, but uh, five female authors, zero male. And from a racial breakdown, I read six white authors and one black author. I also audio booked Anna Green Gables, and I recently re um, read, reread, read Anna Green Gables, Ton of the Child, as a teenager, and we read it in June because I went to Prince Edward Island this summer. Um, and part of my audiobook experiment, I was like, I'm gonna audiobook this. And the version I read was read by Kate Burton, Richard Burton's daughter. She played the vice president in Scandal. She's done a ton of other things, but that's what I know her from. She's a great reader. Like she was doing the voices for all the characters and she was super into it. Um, if we don't know the Anne of Green Gables story, Anne's an orphan, it's Prince Edward Island, Canada, which is kind of like above Maine. Um, She's this 11 year old orphan. There's these Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert, their brother and sister, they're in their 60s, they own this farm. Green Gables is the house on the farm. They wanted to adopt a boy to help on the farm. And I kind of feel sorry for this boy that never actually exists because they were just gonna have him sleep on a couch in the kitchen um, and really just make him a servant on the farm. But they, wanted, they sent a note to someone who was going to adopt a kid from the asylum that they wanted a boy. The message gets flipped, they bring them a girl, they want to send her back, Anne's traumatized, Matthew falls in love with her, they're like, let's keep her, so they keep her. And then basically it's a series of misadventures throughout of Anne. Anne's like talkative, 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 and super imaginative, and just, and her friendships in her life. It's very, um, I remember like once I read it in my 20s as a reread, and I struggled with it that time because it is very, it's, I mean, this one book that's, I have a physical copy as well, that I, this was the one I read in June. This copy is, this, this particular copy is 440 pages long and that covers six years. And because the first, like, it starts off, like, very kind of, like, the beginning of their adoption. But then as she grows up and as they settle into their life, it's like, oh, here's a little story. And here's a little story. But there isn't, like, a huge, like, we're not going to fight a bad guy. And so it doesn't, like, it's not, you know, it's very, anic not anecdotal, not epistolary. Oh, what's the word? But, you know, it's very just, like, each chapter is its own, like, little story. And so at that point in my 20s, it was hard for me to, like, I didn't feel like picking it up because each little story was wrapped up in its own thing. Um, but when I read it in June, I loved it again, and the audiobook was a delight. And yeah, that's like five stars. Um, I've been doing, um, if you're new here, the way I've been kind of handling my um, monthly wrap ups is I've been talking about my favorite books, my least favorite books, then all the books that kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So my favorite book that I read this month or for the month of October, was the first in the Sinister Summer series by Kirsten White, Wretched Water Park. So I actually originally read this in June, but in October it was my, uh, I, I did it on audio. And I'm doing like this little like audio book experiment for myself for fiction books. And I wanted to like listen to something I had already listened, that I had already read, not something brand new, because I'm kind of afraid that I won't be paying attention to it or I won't fully grasp it. So I'm like, oh, if I listen to something I've already read, I won't lose that much if I tune it up. Um, and the sequel just came out and that's also, I read in October. So I was like, oh, it'd be great to revisit and then read the second one and loved it. I mean, I loved it in a physical format. I think the audio format's still really great. I kind of expected a little more of like a spookier. I know um, Series Unfortunate Events, which is a similar vibe. I believe it's Tim Curry who reads those. I was kind of expecting more of like a spookier voice and it's just this cheery lady who's reading them. But uh, in general, I thought it was really great. Um, the jokes hit. 
Uh, I laughed out loud at some points. But so in general, the story, it's a series, it's a brand new series. It came out and started this year. The second one's already out. A third one's dropping in January. And there's a fourth. It's listed on Amazon, but I don't think it's on Goodreads yet. But so we at least have four. I think we're going to have more than that, but I'm not sure we have like a set number yet. Where in Harry Potter, we always knew there were seven. Like, I don't know if we have a set, you know, situation, but there will be at least four. So the story here is that you've got 12 year old twins, Theo, Theodora, but we call her Theo, and Alexander, you only call him Alexander. They're 12 year old twins and their 16 year old um, sister, Wilhelmina, who they call Will. She has a phone, a cell phone, she's always on, she's a teenager, and they call the phone Rodrigo, which I think is funny that he has, they've given him a name. But so, it seems like when they talk about their family life or their parents, they have a great family life, that they have great parents, um, but kind of at the beginning of the story, their parents wake them up in the middle of the night in the summer, and they're like, you're gonna go stay with your aunt, this aunt they've never met, never heard of, no idea who she is, um, and no one really tells them why. They pack them up in the middle of the night. They don't really remember how they get to the aunt. And that's it, the parents go away. They don't know where they go. They don't have contact with them again. Um, it's all very mysterious, because it's supposed to be mysterious. And by the end of the book, I was wondering, like when I had like 10 pages left of this book, I was like, are we gonna find out what's the deal with the parents? Because we don't have a lot of pages left. And you realize like that's the overarching story. Like that's gonna cover all of these books is what what is what are the parents up to? What are they doing? And they uh, and how are they involved in helping them? But so they're dropped off at this aunt's house and Aunt Sophronia. And she's very like, there's a lot of stuff in this book where because it's it's mystery, it's kids. They kind of described it as like, it's a little bit of like, if you really liked um, a series of unfortunate events, which I only could, I read it as an adult. It came out when I was in my twenties, my early twenties. I read the first three or four. I couldn't handle it beyond that because it got very repetitive to me. So I was interested to see how it'll go for this. I definitely see how they can be like related. If you liked one, you would like the other. Um, but so, but so far I really like this more than I liked the other ones. Um, like I said, I thought the other series of Unfortunate Events gets really repetitive. Um, like how many times can he be in a scary costume? Um, and they don't recognize him, you know, or whatever. It's been too long, I don't remember. Um, and I think it also gives more credit to the children and the, like the kids who would read this book. It, it expects more of them and their, um, their understanding of concepts, I think, than Unfortunate Events. But they get dropped off at this aunt's house. This aunt is very, as I said, so like it's mysterious, but I also think there's like some like fantasy aspects to this, but it's all very vague. And I had a friend of mine who reads a lot of fantasy. I was like, you should read this. I think you would like it. But also I need you to help me understand like what is Aunt Sophronia? Cause I kind of think she's a what. And, but what is that what? I don't know. My friend thinks maybe she's a demon. Um, but maybe like a good demon. I don't know. It's never explained. She's not weird. They, they like, they kind of describe her as she's like vague. You kind of, she's transparent, but not, she's not transparent, but she's just sort of like ethereal and she's not really there. Like she doesn't really know the children need food. <laughs> like they open the refrigerator and they're like, we need to eat. Oh, you need to eat. Oh, how will I do that? And they're like, you know, you could just order it on your phone and have it delivered a phone and her kitchen's like out of the 1950s and it's got the wall you know the landline phone and they even make a joke of the kids are like what's this but she like doesn't know how to use a phone she kind of just picks up the phone and like is there food and the kids are all like what is happening um and the kids don't remember anything like they only know remember like at the house the kid like they don't remember how they got to her and they don't really remember like the aunt brings them to this water park. They don't remember the journeys. It's their, their memories are being like white or something. We don't really know. That's gonna, this all better be resolved. Like I'm like, they better have like a really interesting wrap up when this series ends. Um, but like all they remember of this house is the kitchen and the bedroom that they're sleeping in. They don't really remember like anything in between how they get to the kitchen or the bedroom. But the aunt, she's like, I've got you. You're gonna spend a week at this water park. 
We need you to find time. And that's really, it's just how it's worded. We need you to find time. And the kids are like, what? And they get a week pass at the Fathoms of Fun Water Park. It's rated five stars on Gulf. Um, it's a gothic themed water park. Super clever. Like, I love the idea of this, the way she describes it. There are rafts that are cough, like the life, like the, you know, rafts you go down water slides or, um, or uh, coffin shaped. And the bath towel, the beach towels are black. And if you go to the gift shop asking for sunscreen, they give you Victorian umbrellas. And it's so beautifully thought out. Like, I'm obsessed. Um, but they're tasked with this thing of to go find time. And they don't know what she's talking about. It's all very vague. And the adults are that the, the thing that I liked the least about this book, and I love this book, is the vagueness of the adults. And that is sort of the point, because I guess if they were straightforward, then we wouldn't probably have the story. And but I swear to God, if this is not explained at the end of this series, why they had to be vague AF, I'll be really disappointed. Like they need to have a really good explanation for this all to work. Because I mean, but the kids are not like, so it's very frustrating, especially as an adult reading this, the vagueness of the adults. But at least it is purposeful. The kids acknowledge the vagueness. They're like talk to each other like, what is she talking about? What do they mean? Why can't they just tell us what they mean? Um, and but they're at this water park and the staff is weird. They meet this one boy, he's a teenager. Will like has a crush on him, he has a crush on Will. Um, the water park's sort of in his family. He's like the nephew of the owners. He talks about that his parents sort of disappeared. You start having like a running theme of missing parents. Um, but he's like the woman who owns the water park, Miss Widow. Oh, Sinister Summer, the name of the series. The children's last name is Sinister. <laughs> um, their mother's last name is Sinister. Their father's last name is Winterbottom. So they're the Sinister Winterbottoms. They're not actually Sinister. I thought that was clever and cute. But so they're doing, that's a running theme through the series is the last names. Um, the people who own the water parks, last name is Widow. This boy, Edgar, who is friendly with them on the staff, his last name is Black, he's related, so it's like the Widow Blacks, um, or the Black Widows, maybe. But, so they have a lot of fun with the last names. Um, but outside of Edgar, the rest of the staff is very strange and borderline scary and probably beyond borderline irresponsible. And and as the week progresses, fewer and fewer people are visiting the water park. And because, and it's like, because it's so weird and because it's kind of scary and there's like no food, staff is stopping to show up. So there's no like concessions. And even when you had concessions, they were trash. And it's, and they're just kind of like, what's going on? We don't know where our parents are. And we're, constantly being told to go find time we don't know what that means and apparently like pre-story in the past with their parents they would they would go on scavenger hunts in the summer and so they're like maybe this is a scavenger hunt and so they're trying to figure out like what could this possibly mean and you find out that like the woman who owns the water park her husband has gone missing like he went into the wave pool and never came out like how do you go into a wave pool but she didn't die because there's no body, just disappears. And so the kids are like, maybe that's what we're supposed to do. Maybe we're supposed to like solve this. And so that's sort of what the progression of the book is, is that I'm trying to figure out. And then there's like the water slides, there's a tower and there's like seven water slides that come off this tower and they can see somebody, there's somebody in like a window at the top of the tower. And they're like, somebody's in the window and they want to find the missing husband. And they're like, maybe that's all the thing. And so at the end, that's all resolved. Inadvertently, they find time. I won't tell you what that is and how they do it. But, and then at the end of the book, Aunt Sophronia's like, great, you did the thing. And they're like, we did the thing. And, and they're like, all right, next up, we're going to the Sanguine Spa and in the vampiric mountains or whatever and so it straight up leads into the second book and i think this is so much fun i had a blast with it as a full-grown woman 
I think middle grade kids who this is directed towards would have a blast with this. I think reading it with your kids would be fun because they're jokes for grown-ups too. Um, the diversity is really nice. They, um, well, it's all very like slight. The diversity is slight, but it's there. It's like that, that normalizing. I don't even know, like, I probably should be better in like using my, like being familiar with terms and things, but, um, it's all very light handed. Like they're, um, the adopt, the sister, she's adopted. So then you get adopted representation, but then you never get like, you never get anything from her point of view. The story's told from the twins, the younger twins. So you never know, like, does she feel like put out or not included or cause she's also black and the children are, the twins are white. And so you never really get from her point of view, like, does she feel excluded or does she feel like, how does that work? Uh, or not like, how does it work? But you know, like having that otherness, does she feel other? Does she feel included with her family? We never get that point of view. It's just, these are things. Um, Edgar's parents, are, um, his parents are two men. He has two fathers. And that is just said, and no one blinks an eye. Like, and then I think it's mentioned and they're like, oh, it's so sad he doesn't know where his dads are. Like, and it's not even, like, it's just woof woof. Um, and so that's just like, that's really nice. It's just like a normalizing diversity and that sort of thing. Also, I really liked um, Will and her phone. The kids kind of are always like, we love Will, but she's always on our phone. Like they, they kind of like, she's just this all the time, all the time, all the time. And Will's kind of had, had been tasked by the parents, keep an eye on your siblings. And so the kids kind of have this running joke of like, hey, Will, we're gonna go run in the street. There's a kidnapper out there. We're gonna stab him with a knife. And she's like, oh, cool, you know, have fun. And we're supposed to kind of think that she's the like inattentive teenage sibling. But then you kind of realize that she is just as worried about where, like what the deal is with the parents and she's using her phone to like figure out stuff and that she is like paying attention. And when, when she needs, when she knows, like, I think as an adult, I'd be interested in like what a 10 year old thinks when reading Will or reading about Will. But for me, it's very much like, oh, she's vaguely listening. Or you know, when you're like, when you're kind of half paying attention and you can tell when something's not important and something's important, she knows when they're telling her they're gonna go run in the street, they're lying. And so it's nothing to her, but when they say something super important, she's clearly listening. And I like that, how that's represented as a teenager. So many teenagers, I feel like in books directed at kids younger than that, are like the teenagers are the big bad, or, or they're mean to me, or they're not, like they don't wanna include me or whatever. And there is like this, She's on her phone, so she's not playing with her siblings, but that she does clearly care about her siblings. But I really, really like this. I would recommend it. I gave this 4.25 stars. So the next book I'm gonna talk about isn't one of my favorites, but it's just the sequel. So I figured it'd just be easier to go straight into it. So I read the sequel to Wretched Water Park, book two in the Sinister Summer series by Kirsten White, Vampiric Vacation. And this one I physically read and the kid picks up immediately. They're in the car ride um, on their way to this sanguine spa and they get dropped off. And it's more of that like Aunt Sophronia's weird situation where she can't go beyond a certain point. She's left here. Um, she's like, you have to go. And so the kids have to get their like suitcases and like wander through a forest. And then it, it's, they didn't really say like what country they're in. I'm gonna leave, go with that it's the United States. They, because they talk about, they, they, they know the Dracula, like they're aware of Dracula as a concept and as like a pop culture thing. And they talk about, um, they mentioned it in the first book as well. Uh, Alexandra really likes fiction. Theo likes nonfiction and they have their interests and they'll tell each other about things. And so Theo had read about Dracula a long time ago. And so she's aware of this and she's like, mm -hmm. How are we going? Because it was they're going to the little Transylvania mountains, I think. I think that's what it, what it was called, and that's where the spa is. And and it's like, oh, well, Transylvania's in Europe, and this is clearly like a smaller place. And they finally get there, and it's this castle-like building, like on a mountain. And they go in, and it's a spa. And unlike the water park that had like very little people, this is full of people and a lot more children. And 
I struggled with this one in a way that I didn't with the first one. And I think this one relies very heavily on the Dracula story. Like characters have the same names. There's this adult. So I guess like every book's gonna have like a weirdo adult. Um, and so you've got like an adult, this adult running around wearing like a cape and we're supposed to think that maybe he's Dracula, but he's called the Count. And there's this teenage girl named Mina. And then you find out she's got a younger sister named Lucy. And then there's another kid named, who's from Texas, with a lasso and a cowboy hat named Quincy. And there's a trunk that's coming that they had to bring to a room that's got the Helsing on it. It relies very heavily on the Dracula story. To the point where I was wondering, did the first one, was the first one based off a story and I just missed it? So this is so clearly Dracula, like it's Dracula. And, or it's very clearly like trying to hit some of those beats and we have the names. And as so I went back and like thinking about the first one and there is a joke where like they go to a library at some point and Alexander's reading, I can't remember reading Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, but he's reading a Bronte sister's book. And they make like a Bronte joke. And I was like, are we doing Jane Eyre? Because there's like a person in the tower. And I actually Wikipedia because I haven't read Jane Eyre. And I halfway read Wuthering Heights in high school and hated it. Um, I Wikipedia character names. And there are a lot of either character names or Brontes. Like you have a Jane. Um, there's a Charlotte. Um, but in the books, there's like an Edgar, there's a Heathcliff, and those names repeat in the story. And so I was like, are we just doing the Brontes as a whole? Gothic, the Gothic story, person in the attic in Jane Eyre, woman in the attic in Jane Eyre, we got a person in the tower here. And, but this felt like, if that's the case, because I don't have confirmation on that, but that's sort of like my running theory, is that that's because the fourth book, I mentioned that was going to be a fourth book. The fourth book's doing Frankenstein. Like, I can read the description on, there's like a, a Mr. Frank and a Mr. Stein or something like that. And, and so I'm like, they're clearly hitting these sort of like horror kind of concepts. And so I was wondering, I'm like, how did I miss whatever the first one was? And so my general running belief that I'm going with at this moment is that it's, they're doing the Brontes as a whole. But this one is very Dracula. And I think that's its problem compared to the first one. The first one had much more of like an original concept. It wasn't so relying so heavy on like a pre-existing story. It took maybe halfway through the book before the story really got going. And, and once I got there, I was like, oh, cool. Like, this is great. But um, it just took so long because it was just trying to hit these beats of the story and introducing you to these characters that have the same names and like, okay, let's just, can we get with the story, please? Um, adults still as vague, assign, and Sophronia assigns them a new vague AF task. Um, because they don't know what the deal is with their parents. We get more parental backstory of kind of their, just more details about them as people. They seem nice. Um, I'm kind of wondering if their mother is human. I kind of wonder if she doesn't have feet. Um, You'd have to read it to know, get what I'm saying, but I kind of wonder if she doesn't have feet. Um, they, but this one delves a little bit, like once the story got going, um, this, well, so it's supposed to be like a family, vampiric, the Sanguine Spa is supposed to be like a family vacation destination. And Edgar, even from the first book, is even aware of it. They're texting. Will and Edgar are texting. He's like, oh, I've been there with my dads before. Um, so they're like, cool, maybe this won't be terrible. And then there's actually like, a whole bunch of families there. But they immediately separate them. And Mina's even like, oh, back when my parents were here, because her parents have disappeared. So clearly everyone's parents are somewhere doing something that we're not privy to. Um, like back when my parents were here, this was different. And so clearly the Count is changing things. He's running the show. He's separating the parents. He's got them like locked up, some, not locked up, but you see them and they, every time the kids see them, they kind of seem like zombies, but, and we're kind of supposed to think he's taking their blood and then you find out it's not, but like, it's very much trying to hit these beats instead of just letting the story flow. Um, 
But once the story gets going, it does delve more into this mystery a little bit as a whole. We learn some new things. And then the way it ends, I mean, they, they figure out what this thing is Aunt Sofranya wanted. Um, they take a little bit of agency because where Aunt Sofranya wants to take the next is the fourth book. And they have a little bit of agency because they find out something and they're like, and Theo's like, no, 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 Alex. Alexander's like, no, no, no. We want to go here. And she's like, oh, okay. So I'm like, they're, we're learning as we're going. We're getting more information about the stories or about like the family and this mythology and whatever's happening here. And I appreciated that. It just took so long to get there. But there are some good solid jokes in that first half. Like I laughed out loud multiple times. Um, again, I think like the jokes work as an adult. Um, and it's the same thing with the, or like Will's clearly knowing something's up now. And it's where before you're like, oh, like you, you figured out by the end, but this one throughout the whole thing, she's clearly like, WTF, what's going on? Trying to track her parents by credit card. Like she's in it. She's going down the rabbit hole on her cell phone. Um, but they also do that lovely thing with the kind of like, there's a uh, kids, there's a family vacation and there's like a twins? No, there's like four kids, four or five kids. Their names all start with J and then an E. And their mother, they have two moms and it's just said and went on. Um, but what was interesting in this one, and I think it's it's there in the first book, but it's it's much more in this book where Theo, most like it's not named but Theo probably has ADHD AD, uh, ADD or ADHD and she very much talks about like how her teachers don't understand her and that her mom was able to help her and help her like delineate tasks break down tasks for her so she can get things done and she has to stay busy and if she stops she um like thinks too much about this parental situation where her parents are and um and it's very ADHD, from my understanding, ADHD without mentioning the name. And Alexander is very clearly suffering from anxiety. Um, he had that a bit in the first one, but this is much more like his mom would hold him, to, like kind of almost like he was blanket or like a weighted blanket. And, and I'm like, oh, okay. Like, and so like, if you have a kid that's got ADHD and you're looking for some representation in a book and it's not like, the book's not about that. It's not constantly about that. Or a child that has an anxiety, they can relate to these characters in, the, in, the, um, in these books. So I'm giving this one like three and a half. I mean, that last half I thought was really good, but the first half was a drudge for me, which sucked. Um, I'm excited about the third one because when I read the description of the third one, it reminds me of the first one where there's they're going to like a summer camp. It's like creepy camp. I can't remember the name of it. It doesn't matter. But they're going to a summer camp. But it doesn't seem to be like where this is Dracula and the fourth one's going to be Frankenstein. It doesn't seem that there's necessarily like a very specific story they're mimicking. I'm like, maybe it's just like 80s camp horror movies. Like it's in that way of the water parks. I'm kind of hoping this one will sort of stand on its own and not rely so heavily on pre-existing ideas. So I'm really excited about that one. So we'll see how this goes. So the next book I'm going to talk about is... And this is more like probably like a coffee table book or like just an art book, but it's called The Paper Dolls of Zelda Fitzgerald by Eleanor Lan Lanahan. So I got this as an arc. So thanks to Scribner and NetGalley for the digital arc of this. I appreciate it. It comes out uh, this coming Tuesday. Hopefully this will make air by then. <laughs> Maybe it's that same day it'll be on air. Um, so its deal is Zelda Fitzgerald, wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald of Great Gatsby, um, had a hobby of making her own paper dolls. She originally started doing it for her daughter, the woman Emily Lanahan, Emily. Eleanor Lanahan, who wrote this book, is Zelda's granddaughter. Um, but so originally she started making these paper dolls for her daughter and then her daughter kind of grew out of it and she just kept making them. And at some point she wanted to publish them, but it never really got picked up, but she just kept making them and making them. 
And in the beginning of the book has this little like interesting piece about Zelda as a whole, which I didn't really know anything about Zelda. I mean, granted, I don't really know anything about F. Scott either. He wrote Great Gatsby and I know some of his titles and I've read Great Gatsby in high school, but I've never read any of Zelda's work. But she's like a fascinating human being and she had like a, um, they said she had, she had schizophrenia, not schizophrenia. She developed a mental issue where she had to be, um, she would be admit herself into the hospital and work herself out, but she had a very sad death. But she had created these paper dolls and I guess after her death, her um, surviving family, not F. Scott, I think he had already died. Um, but like her parents or brothers and sisters or whatever. She had this like, they took her art and had like basically a garage sale and people took it and whatever. And so a lot of these paper dolls are lost, um, but they finally kind of collected, they finally kind of collected everything that they had and they published them in this book. And yeah, it's the first time they've been collected um, and they're really beautiful. She would, uh, she would sketch her dolls out with pencil and then on illustrated illustration board, and then would paint them in. And I, I, I always read this word and never heard it pronounced, but like gauche, um, opaque watercolors, gouache, I, gauche, I have no idea how it's pronounced. Um, and the clothes that she wore were painted in a light white paper. And it, sometimes she like, she would use like maybe actual fabric or wallpaper or she would use different, um, like, or actual lace to make the clothes and the materials. Um, like, her first set, her first set of dolls were just her family. Like she made one of herself, of F. Scott, of her daughter. And then she sort of progressed to nursery rhymes, Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Bears, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, and then she kind of went to French royalty, and then she was doing King Arthur and the Round Table. And, um... I think she was doing like the Three Musketeers and she kind of just keeps progressing and and it's really interesting to see like her art as it progresses and and she's also got like this really like interesting humor in the pieces um Red Riding Hood she's got um it's very like haute couture like how, like the outfits for these characters um the wolf is in a party dress like there's a got there's an, I've got an outfit for the wolf and then there's like wolf in a party dress and um apparently Zelda was trained as a ballet dancer and she took a uh, course in theater um, costume design and you can so see that in, that in a lot of these pieces especially as she progresses in the hobby where they're very theatrical um the costumes and the flair like I can absolutely see this on stage I can absolutely see this in a ballet on stage um I actually okay so I'm from New Orleans and I have I have a huge interest in the history of Mardi Gras and very specifically like old school Mardi Gras that we don't really have pictures of because Mardi Gras has been around since forever and we would have we had floats before we really had cameras and so the only records we have of a lot of these floats and a lot of the costumes of people on the floats are the illustrations from the costume designers and the float designers and the past year and a half there's been several exhibits or in the past five years or so like the last two years, there's been like multiple ones, exhibits of old sketches of Mardi Gras costumes and from way before cameras. And there were so similarities. I had a friend that I've gone to these exhibits with and I was showing her these. I was like, look at them. Like these look like, cause the old, old Mardi Gras, now the Mardi Gras costumes, most of them, not if you're the king and queen of Rex, not those, but like the regular standard float riders, they're very like cheap like cheap Halloween costume material that it's gonna rip and you'll throw away at the end of the night. Like I rode for the first time this past year and by the end of the night, my costume was like ripped. It, there's these cheap things that are probably made in China or whatever. But like, the original costumes, original Mardi Gras was very like theatrical so that you had a float and it had a theme and they weren't throwing beads originally and people were kind of like, it was almost like like movement art moving art and they would kind of like have like a little cast of characters and so you had these very beautiful costumes that were made by like proper costume designers and so many of these costumes like i was like wow that i these look all look very familiar i'm guessing like time wise that would make sense like the dates wise of these of these things um <coughs> and i kind of wondered apparently zelda's from alabama didn't know that 
And so I wondered if like, had she been to our Mardi Gras, did she go to Mobile, Mardi Gras started in Mobile, um, what was her experience with that? They never get into that. I personally made that correlation. I have no idea if that's like an actual legit thing, but they do have those things. I'm giving this four stars and I think this could be a great book for Christmas to give someone, someone who's maybe got like a quirky art, like who likes quirky books, who likes things to have like a fun conversation piece on the side table. Um, who maybe is a fan of the Fitzgeralds in general and you know they've got all the books and this is something new and different maybe they didn't know about um but so I think this is it was just like a really quick you know breeze through and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I like I said four stars um another favorite book of, that I read that kind of happily lived up to expectations was The Lost Ticket by Freya Sampson um, I saw it on a Facebook book club group. Somebody mentioned it, they read it, and that it was charming and delightful, and I love charming and delightful. And so I checked it out. It was charming and delightful. Um, it takes place in England. This woman, Libby, she pre-story, like immediately pre-story, her long-term boyfriend breaks up with her. They lived in like Suffolk, 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 England. And she kind of grabs a bag full of clothes and goes to stay with her sister in London. Um, pretty much the second she gets in London and gets on the double decker bus, she meets this older man, Frank, and not like creepy older man, like older man. And, and he's like, you remind me of someone. And then you find out that he, um, that back in the sixties when he was a young man, he met this delightfully vivacious woman, with fiery red hair. And they hit it off. He, she gave him his number that he was supposed to call her and they were gonna go to the museum on a date. He loses the ticket. And off and on for the rest of time into this book, he rides this same bus, hoping he would run into her again on this bus. Um, and he tells her the story, she's struck by it. And she sort of becomes friends, well, she becomes friends with him. She decides she wants to help him find her. And she's like, maybe we can like make like an Instagram campaign or like a hashtag and put up posters everywhere. And um, he's got a carer named Dylan who, and this was what I found was annoying because it is sort of like women's fiction, kind of like light romance. And I don't deal well with romance. And this is really lovely kind of on the romance front, but the beginning is so standard drama for drama's sake and I got really I was like no 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 but they kind of get over it pretty quickly and it's fine but she meets him on the bus doesn't realize he's Frank's carer um he yells at her and then she's like oh my god you're shocking me and then it's really he's just like going to the same place um he's we find out um that Frank has Alzheimer's dementia that he's getting worse in his disease. And Dylan's very afraid that like, the failure in finding this woman is going to be devastating to him. And so he's very um, concerned about that. But he goes along and helps her post up these up. They develop a friendship, you know, clearly feelings are involved. Um, and it's just their story. And this was, it was really sweet. It was just a really sweet story. I was, so my only problem, and I suppose it's not even really a problem per se, is that Libby's sister has fertility issues. And it's so, and my issue with it is that it's so barely touched upon. Like it's sort of mentioned, it's mentioned for a future plot point that has nothing to do with the sister. And I feel like you could have had the whole future plot point without this. So if that's like a triggering thing for someone, it is mentioned. It's not really dwelled upon, but it is there. Um, so there's that. But overall, I really, I really, really, really liked this. I flew through it over like one weekend. Um, I'm giving it four and a quarter stars. It, it just sort of was like my almost perfect romance. It was barely a romance. No, but it was just like, it was sweet and it was lovely and it was nice and it was charming and it kind of ticked all those boxes. But four and a quarter stars. So the next book I'm gonna talk about is something I was so looking forward to and 
I was really kind of disappointed by it, but um, the newest American Girl book. Um, if you saw my TBR video for October, this is, I was so excited for this. Meet Claudie in American Girl. It's the, she's the newest American Girl um, doll character. Um, 1922, Harlem Renaissance. Um, written by Britt Bennett. She, Claudie is nine. Um, lives in a boarding house with her little brother Jody. He's six, her parents, and a cast of characters of artists. It's like a singer, there's a painter. Her dad's a baker, her mom's a journalist. Um, I think there's like a musician. Um, but there's like an assortment of artists in her in her boarding house that she lives in. And kind of the idea is that like her best friend, who's barely in the story, is a really good dancer. And she she goes to her at this dancing school and things the Harlem Renaissance. It's at the time in the twenties, you know, Harlem was full of all these amazing people and amazing talents and and she's surrounded that in this boarding house. And so she's at this dancing school and um and she's not really good at it. She doesn't feel it. And God, I feel that. I was in dancing school for 13 years and I was terrible. And I like I got to the point where I knew I was terrible. And her friend's really good. And she's like, I want a talent. And so kind of throughout the book, she's trying to figure out like, well, maybe I could be this. And her dad's a baker. And she's like, well, can I do icing? And she's terrible at it. And he's like, well, you can't just like grab the icing tube and expect to be good at it in one day. Um, and we find out that the boarding house is behind, the woman who owns the boarding house is behind in rent. They raise the rent, I don't remember. But they need to raise a certain amount of money so they can all live there. Cause they're like, we're gonna have to move out. And she's like basically lived there her almost her entire life. These people are like, are her family, even though they aren't really family. And, but at that point, like that's, that's it's such a standard story. Like it's, it's, I mean, Glee did like, like, oh, we need to do the thing and we need to raise $30,000. Then we raise the exact amount of money. We'll put on a talent show and we'll raise the exact amount of money to, to, to do whatever. And it's just like, we've seen the story. We've seen every sitcom has done this story. This does seem to be more of an arc because they decide like, we're going to do a talent show and everybody in the boarding house is going to contribute the talent to this. And she decides like, she's like, well, what is my talent? What am I going to do? And so it's like, well, you can be like a, that she, like throughout the story you talk about, like she can tell stories. She amuses her brother with puppet shows. She makes some stories. Well, like, maybe you could direct, you could put the whole show together. And by the end of the book, like that's the actual show is going to be in a future story. And it picks up, like it ends with her mom's gonna go to Mississippi, Alabama, somewhere in the deep South. And she doesn't want her to go with Claudia really wants to go and she's always promised her that eventually she can go with her to visit her mom's family and she's like not this time and it's all very like terrible things are happening I don't want you to come down there and then she finally at the end is like okay you can come but you gotta do everything I said and that's sort of how the book ends and so the next book will probably be like them going on this and I do wonder like I grew up very heavily with the American Girl dolls and old books I loved them. I think the last ones I read were Kit. Oh, I was too old for Kit, but I wanted to read Kit. Um, and though I haven't read, so I'm like, I know it's like Meat, Learns a Lesson, The Christmas, The Birthday, The Summer, The Winter. And I'm like, if she's just going to Mississippi with her mom, like, I don't know how, like, I mean, that's fine. It's totally fine. But like, will it be learning, like, learning a lesson in that traditional way or have they just gone off? completely from that standard of um how they would do the stories because I mean they used to all do um I think four or five like I don't know if y'all ever noticed this if y'all read the American Girl books every character uh like Samantha the first because it all is like summer school winter and then like spring summer winter like those so you kind of got like two years it was always oh Samantha's 1904 1905 um, Addie was probably like 1864, 65. Like they all had like something four, something five. And this starts in 1922. Um, 
what is nice is so her mom's a journalist for a black newspaper and she visits her mom and she always looks like her mom like if she's covering something kind of really heavy and dark she'll flip the paper over she doesn't want it and she says like the reason she writes for a black newspaper outside of of course she writes for a black newspaper she's a black woman in 1920s and she's like it's good to have to tell our own stories we need to be able to tell our stories um from our point of view and absolutely and they and if you're gonna let your like if you're not gonna be a grown woman reading this book and you're gonna like here let me let my nine-year-old read this book they talk about lynching um and so that might be something you want to sit with your child and talk to them about like of course like these things are hap these things happen and she talks about like the NAACP apparently and I didn't know this they would hang a flag outside of a window every time somebody was lynched to like be like this is happening be aware of it blah 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 um and so they they aren't shy about racial issues and I just thought the story was super basic and I actually was kind of like so I said I was super into the American Girl books when I was um age appropriate and and I was like were these books not that good then were they always not that good? I just have this memory of them being good because I was nine and I didn't know any better. But at the end of the book, so Britt Bennett, I was saying, and I should have said at the beginning, Britt Bennett wrote this. And she's almost the reason I was so excited about this is that she wrote The Vanishing Half, which was amazing and was maybe my favorite, one of my favorite books from last year. And she's a New York Times bestselling author, writes legitimately like published, edited, grown up fiction. And Addie was her favorite doll and it was her favorite girl and she like there's a whole little intro and you see her wearing the Addie dress when she was the age and she interviewed the woman who wrote the Addie books and I'm like oh my god um and so I, I think I expected a lot more of her but it's still even no matter who would have wrote this I would have been like that's really basic and I was just like I was like did were they all this bad and then at the end of the book they gave you like I can't if it, I'm not sure if it's the entire first chapter um or part of the first chapter but they gave you some of the first chapter of the first book of Addie from back when I was like 10 um and if you're not aware Addie was um and her mom were runaway enslaved folk they run up to Chicago New York somewhere somewhere up north and live a life as free people of color and but the first book is them literally running away living on the slave plantation and running away and they give you that first chapter and i'm like holy this is legitimately good like i don't have to pull these out because i have them in like a little like storage case somewhere um they don't live on my shelf at the moment but i'm like i have to pull these out and reread these because that's legitimately good so it's not just oh my nostalgia memory made them good when they weren't they're good and this was just fine like it's important to have this stuff it's good that they're doing more people of color characters that aren't you know in times of trauma um and you see like people who were artists and all that stuff all oh, that's great but i thought like just the story could have been more inventive as a whole but so sadly i'm giving it three point star three three stars but you know, it's there and I'll keep reading them because you can read it in a day. It's fine. But, yeah. so, another book I want to talk about that I was so excited for and I think I was a victim of my own high expectations is The Three Dahlias by Katie Watson. Um, it's going to be the first of a series. The second comes out in October? No, July. It comes out in July of 2023. And it's, um, I got it as an ARC. So thank you to Nakali and Hatchet. Is that how we pronounce it? To Hachet. <laughs> thank you to Hatchet Book, the book group and Nakali for this arc. So it's deal, like it's premise is super cool, right? And it, it, it's playing off of Agatha Christie of the Golden Age Detective, who is a very prolific author and who wrote a ton of cozy, kind of like the old school cozy mystery novels. And uh, the author's name, the fictional author's name is Latisse Davenport. I suppose it could be Lettuce, but we're gonna go with Latisse, but I honestly to God, I kept right reading it as Lettuce Davenport. 
But Latisse Davenport, also known as Letty, she has since passed away, like, pre-story. Agatha Christie, you know, it's been a while. But, um, the house she lived in, she lived in her brother's house, and now, like, her nephew and his wife and his granddaughter live in this house, and they do a fan convention. Her Miss Marple, or her Hackerel Poirot, is named Dahlia Lively, and that is the name of our real series. Um, and so people are fans of the books. So people are fans of the books, but then they've also made various film and TV adaptations of the Dahlia Lively stories. And this is where we get our three Dahlias. So we have So we have Dahlia number one, who is Rosalind, and she was our first adaptation. They made three movies with her. And our second Dahlia is Caro. It's like Cora, but the vowels are flipped, Caro. And she was, they made a TV show with her and it ran for years and years and years. So she's one of the more familiar ones to like the general public. And then our third Dahlia is Posey, and she's going to be the future Dahlia. They're about to make a movie. They're going to make an announcement at this command convention that she's going to play her. She was a child star, had her Lindsay Lohan issues, and is coming back up and hoping this will be like the kick to her career, the kickstart back to her career. But so they're having this fan convention. The story takes place over a weekend, like a bank holiday weekend. Um, so the premise is really cool. I love this meta kind of fiction thing. Of course, someone dies, and then these three women, who are not detectives, but have played one on TV, kind of decide we're going to solve this, this murder, yada, 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 and so forth. And there's jealousies and rivalries between, there's jealousies and rivalries between some of the Dahlias. Like, I was the Dahlia, you're just the second Dahlia, and blah, blah, blah. Sorry, my cat is chewing the extension cord. Hey, what's that? What's that? that? But my problem came in. Where my problem came in comes in was sort of the writing and the way the author decided to put it together. So the very first chapter is like the day before the convention starts, like the Friday, I guess. And Rosalind is a friend of the family. She knew. Latisse, when she was alive, she met her a few times. You find out she's been having a long-term affair with the nephew, and he's married to her best friend, and that's how they met, was through her. It's drama, but the first chapter, honest to God, I thought was kind of trash, and that turned me off of the whole thing, because it was just, it was so clearly exposition to set players up and whether or not these are things that came true, they were so clearly meant to be either the solution or red herrings or whatever. But it was just like, oh, God. Like, it was just so obvious what was happening in that chapter. And then the next chapter was first day of the convention and was told, hey. And more so than even the second chapter, just like the next section of the book is told through Dahlia number three, Posey, who's about to become um, the next Dahlia. And it's all day Saturday, all day. And then the next section is Caro's chapter or section and that's Sunday and that's all her. And it felt very, I liked Posey's section best. And then cozy section best, but they were constantly like reading into each other's like, oh, I saw her look at me like that. That must mean, or I wonder if she's thinking, yada, yada, yada. And it just became like, by the time you would get to the other person's point of view, and then they would go like, oh, I noticed that happened. And this is what they thought. It just felt, it got repetitive. I would have really liked them to be all three together. Like maybe just a chapter, every other chapter, not the whole sections of the book from point of view to point of view. Because then the last day, they do all join together. And that actually is really pleasurable and an interesting, and the end result was actually really nice. I, I, I think I will read the second 
since now my expectations have been, you know, I think appropriately adjusted. But it was also a really interesting commentary. Like she, she doesn't make it a whole plot point, but she does talk about gatekeeping a fandom. Like there's a, a person in the, as a guest at this fan convention who, who's I think Indian or Middle Eastern and he's younger and you can tell that he feels kind of off put being there. At some point he's like, what, you think I'm not like good enough? Because he's a new fan too. He's only recently become a fan. What, I'm not good enough? And they're like, no, it's fine. I don't mind you being a fan, but like apparently like, and that's, I've seen that in other fandoms, Doctor Who, and just like, if you haven't been around since the beginning, you're not a fan enough. You're not a good fan. You're not like a proper fan. And I thought that was really interesting that she brought that up. And there was also a line, because I have this thing, and I've talked about it before. Where I don't like to read about grief. But I read a ton of mystery novels, and that's always a dead person. But cozy mysteries especially, but many mysteries even not cozy, we have no relationship to the dead person. And so it, I don't have to feel the grief of the dead person. So I can read about it, but not have that kind of trauma, right? And there's a line in here. Murders in Latisse's books were safe, almost. A puzzle more than a loss. And I was like, wow, that's really absolutely true, at least in my case, is that like, I don't, I just don't have that relationship to the dead person, so it doesn't matter. You know what I mean. Um, and so I'm giving this three stars. The premise is great. I think more or less the follow through could have been better. Um, but yeah, I'll read the second one. We'll see how that goes. And then we'll see if we continue beyond that point. Um, yeah. Thank you all for watching this video. It's been a long time coming. My lights died the first time I tried to shoot this. Had to shoot it again. And then just Christmas. And I decided to make a bunch of crafts for a bunch of people in the last month. And that kind of overrides me making videos. So I know it's late. I know it's January. But, you know, here we are. <laughs> Have a good one.